8. Caspian Sea Monster After more than three decades, a monstrous sea craft left to rot in the Caspian Sea was finally hauled away by a team of vessels to the Russian coast. The 380-ton Lund-class Ekranoplan was abandoned after the Soviet Union collapsed in the 1990s. A remnant of turbulent times for Russia, the vessel was left at the Kaspisk naval base as a sign of the failed attempt of Russian coup against General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. Ekranoplans were a type of ground-effect vehicle a hybrid between airplanes and ships that could soar over water without actually touching it. Their signature maneuver was to skim the surface of the water from between 3 feet and 16 feet, making them a stealthy, speedy tool in the Russian military arsenal. It could travel up to 550 kilometers per hour. Because they can soar so close to the water, they're hard to detect on radar, something that the Soviet military developed during the Cold War. The only surviving vessel of its class ever completed and entered into service, the Lund had six anti-ship missiles on top of its hull and could take off and land in stormy conditions. So why was the vessel abandoned if it was such a modern marvel? At the time that the first Lund was active, a second unarmed vessel that was planned for rescue and supply missions was almost ready for completion when, for some reason, Russia pulled the plug on the entire program leaving the condemned vehicle to rust away at Caspian Naval Base. But that doesn't mean that's necessarily the end for the Lun. The machine was moved to the city of Durban, where it will be the star attraction at a new military museum and theme park called Patriot Park, where other Soviet and Russian military vehicles will be put on display. And if you had hopes of one day seeing an Ekranoplan on the move, various Russian groups have been working over the past few years to create a line of commercial Ekranoplans to carry passengers. 7. Old Car City Make an 80-kilometer, 50-mile drive from Atlanta and you'll roll up on a massive 34-acre compound, where you'll find arguably the largest junkyard in the world. The 80-year-old tourist attraction is filled with more than 4,500 cars that have been abandoned by their owners. The Old Car City started out as a general store in the 1950s, owned by the Lewis family, who sold clothing, car parts, and tires to passers-by. During the Second World War, when steel and tires became scarce, the Lewis family shifted gears by transforming the store into an auto salvage yard. In 1970, Dean, one of the Lewis children, decided to start preserving old cars, and his hobby quickly took off as he got his hands on more and more old vehicles. With everything from classic Fords, big fin Cadillacs, and rare trucks, visitors can spend the day walking the 6-mile, 9.65-kilometer lot to see all the treasures of the past Dean's collected. He even has cars from movies, including one featuring Johnny Cash. As his collection grew, Dean had to buy up more land to hold his collection. Even though he was a bit of a stickler, Waiting until someone offered up the right price for his prized vehicles, Dean found yet another way to make money to sustain his business. Instead of selling off cars, he found that by turning the junkyard into a tourist attraction and charging admission, he made way more money than selling parts. What started as a way to keep food on the table is now a way for one car collector to continue his hobby while sharing it with those who want to see an endless collection of classic cars. The colorful, rusted-out vehicles also make for excellent social media posts. So if you ever happen to be near Atlanta, take a shortcut to Old Car City and snap a few selfies. 6. The Iron Scow A ship that's been stranded high above Niagara Falls, Canada for over a hundred years recently went for a bit of a thrilling ride. Since 1918, the Dumping Scow, a type of barge, sat launched on a rocky perch after two men stranded on the vessel had to open its bottom doors to flood the ship long enough to slow it down. While out on a dredging operation in August 2018, the men became stuck in the shallow rapids only 600 meters from the edge of the massive waterfall after the scow broke loose from the tugboat that had been hauling it. The men were later safely brought ashore. But the scow was in such a dangerous position so close to the edge of the falls that experts decided it was a lost cause and abandoned it there. 
Visitors to Niagara Falls had become so used to seeing the rusted, hollowed-out ruins in the water, they were understandably shocked when in 2019, a severe wind and rainstorm moved the scow, sending it careening onto its side. Even though some might see it as a bit of an eyesore, it had become a staple to the Niagara experience. Even though the storm sent it almost 50 meters closer to the edge, it still sits in the Niagara River, with some parts slowly breaking off from the force of the water. The rusted hull is still somewhat intact, so if you happen to be driving down the Niagara Parkway, take a look toward the river and you might spot the rusted scow still sitting just above the falls. Have you ever been to Niagara Falls and seen the Iron Scow? What did you think about it? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already for more videos about incredible abandoned stuff. 5. The Rise and Fall of the DeLorean In the dark woods of Northern California, a car made famous in the Back to the Future films sits rusting with no clues about how it got there. It isn't the actual car used by Michael J. Fox in the movie franchise, but it is a rare DeLorean made famous for its unique gullwing doors. Discovered covered in dust in 2009 on private property, but otherwise looking like it had been taken care of, online enthusiasts were shocked at the car's state, but they quickly moved into action and tried to get in touch with the landowner to buy the car so they could restore it. Sadly, they had no luck in finding them. The DeLorean was the only car ever made by DMC, the DeLorean Motor Company, making the abandoned vehicle even rarer. The man behind the design experienced the rise and fall of his company in a matter of years. Development for the car started in the mid-1970s, but the first production run of the cars wouldn't come until 1980. As soon as it was released to the public, the Italian design, British-engineered, American-built car in Ireland caught the eye of car enthusiasts everywhere. Its stainless steel body was definitely unique, but its speed, up to 109 miles per hour, wasn't as impressive. Only 9,000 cars were built in its two years of production. After being featured in the Back to the Future movies, the DeLorean was immortalized as the ultimate cool car with the new DeLorean company in Texas keeping the original design alive to this day. So, if you're driving down the street and see a shining silver car with distinctive gullwing doors, it's probably not Marty McFly, right? 4. Historic Migrant Ship 25 years ago, after a migrant ship sunk off the coast of Glasgow, Scotland, its secrets are about to be revealed in a massive restoration project. Built in 1864, the iron-framed clipper ship, the City of Adelaide, once carried thousands of migrants from London to Plymouth and on to Australia, carrying wool and copper on its return trip. Nearly 250,000 Australians can trace their ancestry back to passengers who made the journey on the Adelaide before it was retired from service in 1887 as steamships took over. Later sold for service in the North American timber trade, the ship also later served as an isolation hospital near Southampton in the UK before it was taken over by the Royal Navy for training in the 1920s. Before it mysteriously sank, it was also used as a floating club room for the Royal Navy Reserves. That's quite a history. After it was moved to the Scottish Maritime Museum, the ship was nearly destroyed. When the museum couldn't afford to refurbish it, a campaign was started to relocate the clipper to its namesake city in Australia. But the restoration almost didn't happen when the river and the protected wetlands where it was moored were at risk of being endangered during the move. Luckily, Australian engineers came up with a plan to move it onto a low barge for the journey to Adelaide. It took almost a year to clean up the inside, removing lead paint and making it safe for visitors. Now, those who want to get up close to history can step foot on the once abandoned ship that's now been given a new lease on life. And for the people whose ancestors once traveled on the ship in search of a new life, family histories can now come to life. 3. Mystery Car Graveyard It's not uncommon to find abandoned cars on the side of a remote road or even left to rust in the forest. But a group of urban explorers didn't expect to find hundreds of cars hidden inside a Welsh cave. About 200 feet below the surface, 
the group discovered the cars in various states of decay, cascading down the steep slope. Most were from the 1970s, but considering the mine closed in 1960, one can't help but wonder how all those cars got there and why they were dumped there to begin with. The conditions there were extremely dangerous, with slate falling from the ceiling, and the inside of the mine was very unstable. The team of explorers used ropes to descend into the mine, and as soon as they were inside, they realized just how dangerous the location was. Some of the explorers think the dark, slippery roads could be why so many vehicles met their end at the bottom of the mine. Whether they got there because they skidded off the road or because someone dumped them there, mystery still surrounds the car graveyard and how it became the location of so many abandoned vehicles. 2. World War II Tanks in France Normandy's strategic placement in northern France made it the opportune place to launch one of the largest military assaults during World War II. 156,000 American, Canadian, and British troops landed on five different beaches along the Normandy coast in June 1944, and two months later, all of northern France was liberated from German forces. With so much fighting between military forces in the area, it's no surprise that remnants of these battles still linger to this day. And in the sandy dunes of Beville, 300 hectares of the coastline are now home to rusted old tanks and trucks once used for firing practice. During the war, Germans had taken control of the town, setting up to the north where they could look down upon the commune and observe American troops who had been sent to the area to liberate it from the Nazis. Even after the area was taken from the Germans, it continued to be a place where explosions and gunfire rang out. Until 2014, the French army continued to use the remote location as a place to practice maneuvers. It was too expensive to move the old tanks and trucks, so the army left them there, and the landscape seems to have reclaimed them. Wildlife, including different species of birds, butterflies, and flowers have returned to the dunes offering a glimpse of beauty among the ruins and a reminder that after war, there can be peace. 1. Sweden's Car Cemetery Most car lovers like to display their vehicles in a pristine condition. But a man in Sweden who came across multiple vehicles abandoned in the forest decided to start his own collection from the misplaced cars. After spotting a tract of unused bog land, Ake Danielson decided it would be the perfect place to put his growing collection of abandoned old vehicles. Over the years, Danielson continued adding to the collection and ended up with a side hustle where he sold spare parts from his makeshift scrapyard. As he amassed countless buses and cars in various states of decay, Danielson found that his collection wasn't only a draw for those who needed parts for their own cars. It ended up becoming a haven for journalists and photographers who were attracted by the beautiful decay found in the car cemetery. As the bog started getting more attention, the government took notice, and soon, they were intent on shutting it down out of concern for what the rusted, decaying cars might be doing to the environment. Luckily, Danielson had such a loyal following that the masses came to his defense and stopped the government from closing it down for good. Sadly, Danielson passed away in 2000, but his legacy remains. The abandoned vehicles still sit in the swampy Swedish countryside for those adventurous types who want to trek out to the middle of nowhere for some stylish photo ops. Are post-apocalyptic looking car graveyards worth adding to your Instagram feed? Number 10. Violent Polar Bears in one of the most shocking animal discoveries of 2021, a team of scientists finally confirmed that polar bears do indeed use tools. But what might really shock you is that the behavior is nothing new and has been witnessed by visitors to the Arctic ever since the later part of the 18th century. And for centuries before that, the Inuit people knew all about the craftiness of polar bears. These aren't just cuddly white monsters that can rip your flesh off. They're just as clever as a lot of primates. What kind of tools do the polar bears use? They use tools primarily for murdering walruses. 
Just because they're crafty doesn't mean they're nice. Polar bears will sometimes sneak up on walruses in the frozen Arctic, wait until they get extremely close, and then bop the walrus on the head with a rock or a large block of ice. Polar bears will carry their murder tools in their paws and then either smash an unsuspecting victim over the skull or throw the heavy object off a cliff onto animals lounging at the bottom. This may sound like something out of a Bugs Bunny cartoon, but it's 100% true. The study looked at anecdotes from the Inuit describing such behavior, as well as tales from explorers throughout the past 200 years. The scientists thought they were dealing with a myth, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. The stories of polar bears and their killer tools are so widespread and consistent that they're almost certainly true. However, scientists still haven't actually caught a polar bear in the act, which will be the final confirmation. Number 9. The Great Wall of Ice just over 13,000 years ago, the first human beings migrated over a land bridge that stretched all the way from Siberia to Alaska. However, there's been a debate going on for decades as to when exactly the first human migrants stepped foot on the North American continent. Some have argued 13,000 years approximately, while others have put forth wilder theories saying humans came tens of thousands of years before that. Well, a new study has confirmed beyond any shadow of a doubt that human beings did not migrate into North America until approximately 13,800 years ago. This is because up until that point, the land route from Siberia into Alaska was blocked by a massive wall of ice. This ice wall was 3,000 feet high, a literal blockade of frozen spikes that would have been impassable for anyone until the ice melted. This information is brought to us by an international research team led by archaeologist Jory Clark of Oregon State University. The team looked at the extent of the ice sheet all along the corridor that ancient migrants would have taken into America, revealing the biggest surprise in science since the hole in the ozone layer. We already knew that there was ice, but not that a literal wall of it blocked anyone from entering the land. The discovery puts an end to any debate about human settlers moving into America. There's just no way early people could have gotten over the giant wall of ice. Number 8. Siberian Dog Graveyard A creepy dog graveyard has been discovered in the frigid land of Siberia. And while finding a dog in a graveyard is pretty weird on its own, this one takes it to a whole new level. Researchers suggest that not only did the ancient Siberians bury their pets in a mass graveyard, they also ate them a little bit first. The dogs lived in the village of Ustpoloi and had three main duties. They pulled sleds, they hunted reindeer and birds, and they were sacrificed in mysterious rituals. But during this time, some dogs also formed extraordinary bonds with their owners. At least five dog skeletons in the graveyard were discovered very carefully buried, a clear sign they had been cherished in life. However, other dogs were not buried with such compassion. Many showed evidence that they had been feasted upon. In fact, researchers found a pile of 15 dog heads with their skulls broken apart and their brains slurped out. It seems some people used their dogs as work animals, then ate them when they became useless, while a much smaller population treated their dogs as their best friends. Number 7. Stone Age Hunters on a remote island in the frozen extremes of northern Siberia, Russian researchers found mammoth bones. But these mammoth bones were unique in that they had ancient cut marks on them, evidence of Stone Age hunter activity deep within the Arctic Circle. It's incredible because this has proved to be the most northern evidence of Paleolithic humans. In other words, these cut pieces of bone represent the most northern wandering humans in prehistoric history. It was about 26,000 years ago on Katelny Island, 615 miles north of the Arctic Circle. According to expedition leader Alexander Kandiba, this discovery proves human beings lived much higher in the north than anyone had previously believed. Up until now, the most northern trace of Stone Age humans was in the Yakusha region of Siberia, over 370 miles south. Of course, these ancient hunters wouldn't have been building cities or settlements. They undoubtedly lived in camps, with really small populations. The reason they wandered so far in the north was probably that they hunted woolly mammoths. The bones found by researchers had cut marks and notches left behind by bone tools. This indicates the animal had been butchered, probably after the nomadic hunters tracked it through the ice and killed it. What do you think life was like in the frozen misery of Siberia for hunters 26,000 years ago? Let us know your thoughts in the comments and don't forget to subscribe before the end of the video. Number 6. The Basque Whaling Station The Basque Whaling Station in northwestern Iceland is one of the weirder archaeological sites in the country. Recent excavations here at the 17th century whaling station have raised some pretty interesting questions about the history of Iceland. According to project manager Ragnar Edvardsson, the base was extremely large and in operation from at least between 1610 to 1660. About 20 or 50 whalers lived at the base in the frozen Icelandic wasteland. But near the end of its use, it found itself taken from the Basques who had built it by either the Dutch or English as they gained control of the Atlantic whaling trade. 
But there are a few mysteries scientists are confused about. First of all, even though the whaling station was obviously a hugely important part of the area, it doesn't show up in any written documents from that time. This is bizarre considering the station, now an ugly ruin, was operating on an industrial scale. Another weird thing is that Icelanders, although they worked for the whalers, never took up whaling themselves. They just kind of let foreigners come in, the Basque who built the base being from Spain, and kill all their whales. The Icelanders didn't actually start whaling until the 20th century, nearly 400 years later. Number 5. The World's Oldest Snowshoe For 12 years, the oldest snowshoe ever discovered sat in the office of an Italian cartographer. He believed the artifact was only about a century old, but as it turns out, the snowshoe actually dates back 5,800 years. The cartographer's name is Simone Bartolini, and he was in the middle of mapping Italy's border region with Austria when he came across the snowshoe. He was way up in the mountains at an altitude of over 10,000 feet and spotted a wooden object sticking out from the snow and ice. It was a piece of birch wood bent into a circle, clearly made to be some kind of primitive walking implement. He liked the way it looked and took it home with him. Then, for years, the snowshoe sat in his Florence office. It wasn't until over a decade later that he got curious and started wondering just how old the snowshoe really is. He gave it to an archaeologist who then dated the implement to 3700 BC. It came from not only around the same time as Utzi the Iceman, but it was even found right in the same place as the legendary frozen caveman. The snowshoe is even older than Egyptian mummies. As for what happened to the snowshoe, Bartolini gave it up to the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology, the same place that houses Utzi. Number 4. Retracing Utzi's Steps Chances are you've heard of Utzi the Iceman before. He was discovered in 1991 by hikers climbing the eastern side of Finale Spitze, a peak in the Utztal Alps. He was stuck at a height of 10,532 feet above sea level, frozen there for 5,300 years. Ever since his discovery, countless studies on the Iceman have been done. What made Utzi unique is that he was literally frozen in ice like a corpse in a freezer. He was still so well preserved that scientists were able to recreate the tattoos on his skin. Most recently, scientists have decided to retrace his steps to see where exactly he came from. Archaeobotanist Jim Dickinson and his team of scientists at the University of Glasgow looked at traces of plant and fungi preserved in his gut and found on his clothing. They discovered that between 70 and 75 percent of the plant species were not local to the mountain. They were then able to test the various species to see exactly where Utzi had come from. This is pretty incredible science. Researchers were able to look at grass residue that had gotten stuck on his shoes and coat, then match that with other mosses and liverworts found on his hat and loincloth. We now know that Utzi was accidentally climbing straight up to heaven. He had entered the mountains from the south, probably hoping to make his way through them. He'd walked from a low area of warm forests no more than 600 feet above sea level, then continued up and up before eventually freezing to death in the gorge. Evidence of certain mosses in his stomach even suggests that he stopped in the forest to self-medicate with natural herbs. He may even have been wounded or even ill. But the one question that hasn't been answered is why? Why did Utzi climb from the forest way up into the mountain, only to freeze to death in the most inhospitable place imaginable? That is something we will probably never know. Researchers discovered a giant javelin embedded in the rib of a mammoth in Poland. It's one of the earliest pieces of evidence that humans hunted mammoths with advanced weapons. It's been pretty clear to researchers that humans did indeed hunt mammoths tens of thousands of years ago, but there's always been some speculation as to how exactly humans were able to take down such giant beasts. Some believe arrows were used, but that wouldn't actually make much sense. Prehistoric arrows wouldn't have had the force needed to break the furry flesh of the mammoth, never mind kill one. And so in comes the javelin. The artifact is about 25,000 years old, a giant spear that would have been thrown with tremendous force and probably from a distance. The force was enough to pierce the thick skin of the mammoth, slice through the even thicker layer of fat, and then penetrate the bone. The blow definitely didn't kill the mammoth by itself, but a few dozen others definitely could have done the job. So far, this is the most reasonable explanation for how ancient humans killed these beasts. Even after almost 30,000 years, the oversized spear is still sticking in the animal's bone. Number 2. Frozen Ships In 2021, a sudden accumulation of sea ice along Russia's East Arctic coast resulted in several ships being literally encased in ice. The Tixi, Yama Libris, Polar King, and Arshinevsky were all sitting in the area of the Kara Sea waiting for an icebreaker to save them. This was a pretty major issue because the ships were loaded with thousands of tons of equipment for the locals in the Chukotka region. But that equipment never showed up, at least not when it was needed. Once the ships were broken free, they turned around and fled the ice, and it was only mid-November. 
They had to return to Arkhangelsk to unload their cargo, and then the people of Chukotka had to wait until early January for a nuclear-powered container ship to break through the thick ice and deliver the cargo. Number 1. A Cup in Siberia In a remote region of Arctic Russia, an ancient cup from Persia was discovered many thousands of miles from its home. The medieval bronze cup had originally been fashioned in Iran, yet was discovered by scientists on an expedition to the Gidon Peninsula to monitor permafrost. To give you an idea of where this is, it's in the part of the map that's always white. It's way in the north of Russia, near the Kara Sea and Lake Parasinto, where every day is winter. It's the most northern place any kind of artifact from ancient Persia has ever been found, leaving scientists scratching their heads. Persian artifacts have been found in western Siberia before, but way down near the bottom, closer to the borders of Kazakhstan and Mongolia. To make the discovery even more mysterious, the cup was found stuck in the permafrost, only visible because some of the ice had already melted. Researcher Andrei Gusev for the Center of Arctic Studies described it as a totally random find. In all likelihood, some ancient group of people had set up camp here in the north, realized it was too cold and too terrible, and packed up and left. When they left, they forgot their medieval cup, which they'd probably acquired through trade. It then sat there in the snow for a full thousand years. Number 10. Linwood Hall, Pennsylvania One of America's greatest surviving Gilded Age houses is a stunning neoclassical revival masterpiece. The elegant property was once one of Pennsylvania's finest pieces of real estate, but it fell into disrepair because of a complicated and tragic history yet it still holds its fair share of secrets. The mysteries of this fascinating abandoned estate will shake you to your core, from beautiful interiors and underground passageways to its sad Titanic link. U.S. businessman, prolific art collector, and Titanic investor Peter Errol Brown Widener had this turn-of-the-century home in Philadelphia known as Linwood Hall built between 1897 and 1900. Construction crews built the house on a massive 480-acre estate in Elkins Park, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. After his wife died, Widener enlisted the help of renowned American architect Horace Trumbauer to create a new home for him and his children. This became Linwood Hall, a 70,000-square-foot limestone structure in the shape of a T. Analysts estimate it cost $8 million to build. It had 110 rooms, including 55 bedrooms and 20 baths, as well as an art gallery and a ballroom that can hold a 1,000 people. Widener was a shareholder in the RMS Titanic, the world's most famous passenger liner. When the Titanic sank to the bottom of the North Atlantic Ocean, both George and Harry died. The historic passenger liner collided with an iceberg, causing massive damage. There were approximately 2,224 persons on board. More than half of the passengers died, making the Titanic one of the worst maritime disasters in history. As a result, neither George nor his son Harry lived to see Linwood Hall pass down to them. Widener's only surviving child, Joseph, assumed control of the costly estate and inherited a wealth believed to be worth over $60 million. Between 1915 and 1940, he took over the estate's outstanding art collection and opened the home's private gallery to the public, sharing his father's passion for art. As a result, the property earned the moniker the House of Art. When Joseph died in 1943, neither of his children wanted to take on the monumental task of running Linwood Hall. The family abandoned the old house, and it swiftly fell into decay. But in 1948, a developer bought the estate and its acreage for the low price of $130,000. In 1952, the Faith Theological Seminary bought the estate. The group paid $192,000, but it continued to deteriorate further after they sold off many of Linwood's significant assets, including over 350 acres of land. The property now sits on merely 33 acres. This is one costly abandoned mansion that has gone from amazing luxury to a horrible state. Number 9. Wickoff Villa, New York over eight decades have passed since anyone has lived in this dilapidated castle across the border from Canada. The crumbling property, which is exposed to unforgiving weather, would cost millions to restore to its former beauty. While spirits don't haunt the abandoned estate, it is unmistakably a ghost of its former self. And the story behind it is tragic. According to news sources, businessman William O. Wyckoff had the once grand estate built on the small island in the 1890s as a vacation home. He made his money selling the newly invented typewriter to E. Remington & Sons Company. With his fortune, he chose to construct a holiday home on the banks of the St. Lawrence River. On his first night at the house, the owner reportedly died of a heart attack. His wife died a month before the house was ready. Although the family probably lost most of their fortune during the Great Depression, Wyckoff passed the estate down to one of his sons. Nobody has lived in the house since 1927. The current owners live in a cottage nearby and sold the villa several years ago. It's been on and off the market, waiting for a buyer willing to throw the mansion a life preserver. 
It happened first in 2012 and then again in 2015, all for the same amount. This does not include the work that the future owner will have to complete. Number 8. Shaune No. 81, China It was 1949 and the communists had just won the civil war over the nationalists. According to legend, a high-ranking official in Beijing abandoned his wife during the losing army's hasty retreat to Taiwan, leaving her to fend for herself as the communists marched into the capital. The wife, distraught, committed suicide by hanging herself from the rafters of their three-story French Baroque mansion. Locals claim that the spirit of the scorned woman has been haunting the house ever since. The house, Chow Ney No. 81, today appears to be the ideal breeding place for ghostly activity with its floor-to-ceiling cobwebs and collapsing flooring. The mansion has stood uninhabited for years, turning into a lonely enclave. According to folklore, the Qing royal dynasty built it as a church for the British inhabitants of Beijing. In recent years, there has been a boom of interest in the house, with rumors circulating online and word of mouth spreading about a new film set there. The elaborate banisters and shards of ornamental tile flooring are the only remnants of the mansion's past beauty on the inside. Building materials, beer bottles, and cigarette butts litter the area, much of it left by the many young adventurers who sneak in late at night to experience the thrill. Number 7. Villa de Vecchi, Italy Villa de Vecchi is a 19th century villa in Cortanova, just east of Lake Como, also known as Casa Rosa because of its original red tent. Count Felix de Vecchi, the head of the Italian National Guard and a patriotic hero for his role in the revolution in 1848 that resulted in Milan's freedom from Austria, commissioned the property. Despite its magnificence and excellent location, the property has been vacant for decades. Locals have linked the house to several legends over the years. The property has earned the nicknames Ghost Mansion and Casa de la Streghi, which translates to House of Witches. Architect Alessandro Sidoli designed and erected the Villa de Vecchi between 1854 and 1857 as Count Felix de Vecchi's summer house. De Vecchi, a well-read and well-traveled man, designed his new home in a mix of Baroque and classical Eastern styles. The Count supposedly arrived home in 1862 to discover his wife brutally murdered and his daughter abducted. He committed suicide at home after a long and fruitless search for his daughter. Historians have recently discredited this. The Count's wife had already died, and he was suffering from liver problems when he moved into the home. He handed the property over to his brother Biago after he died at 46. Biago planned to change the property, eventually removing the dome and completely erasing the eastern influence. He and his successors would own the land until 1938. After that, they abandoned it and the house remained empty for around 20 years. Local businessmen eventually bought the home. By that time, people had looted and destroyed much of the home's interior. Villa de Vecchi is now abandoned, having been uninhabited since 1938. The Italian Environment Fund has run public awareness initiatives for the property in recent years. The site has gotten more attention over time because of its reported paranormal activities. It's earned the title of Italy's most haunted mansion. Number 6. Bannerman Castle, New York if you've ever stood along the Hudson River near Newburgh and gazed out over the water, you've probably noticed the abandoned castle perched on an island in the center of the river. Your eyes aren't playing tricks on you. The impressive Bannerman Castle is on the six-acre land known officially as Polypel Island. Francis Bannerman, a Scottish armaments dealer, is the man who bought the island in 1900 and began construction the following year. While still in his teens, Bannerman launched a military surplus company after the Civil War. His company quickly rose to the top of the world's military surplus market. He promptly constructed an extensive showroom on Broadway and Broom Street and supplied weapons to Spanish-American war volunteers. Bannerman profited handsomely during the fight, purchasing 90% of all captured Spanish armaments. He then wanted a secure location away from crowded regions to keep his massive hoard. Polypal Island was a good choice because it was unoccupied and natives claimed spirits haunted it. When Bannerman purchased the island, he began designing his armory room and storehouse, settling on the style of the Scottish castles he had visited. An armory, storerooms, and even a summer palace with docks, towers, and a moat were all depicted in the intricate design. Bannerman himself landscaped the grounds. When Bannerman died, the castle was still being built. The powder house blew up in 1920, proving the complex needed to be built on an abandoned island. The explosion, which was produced by 200 tons of shells, destroyed the castle's tower. Bannerman's family remained on the island until around 1930 when it fell into decay and neglect. Another fire, this time alleged to be arson, reduced the castle to ruins in 1969. It has remained a ghost house since then. What's the spookiest place you've ever visited? Tell me your experience in the comments below. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of our exciting videos. Number 5. Min Chong Ghost House, Taiwan the Min Chong Ghost Home, voted the spookiest haunted house in 2019, lives up to its reputation. 
Legends surrounding the estate range from marital affairs to suicide to secret societies. But whatever you may think, the dead may haunt this property. In 1929, Liu Rongyu built the Baroque rival-style palace, also known as the Old Liu House, and sits amongst overgrown flora. According to one of the most common legends, a housemaid had an affair with the homeowner, a deed that angered his wife. Her pressure would later drive the maid to take her own life, drowning in a neighbor's well. As if this story isn't enough, another myth suggests that a soldier committed suicide after hearing mysterious voices in the house. The enormous estate contains some strange history within its magnificent but decaying walls. Number 4. Halcyon Hall, New York This spooky Gothic palace was formerly the home of New York women who pursued higher education. The Bennett School was a six-year women-only institution before becoming a junior college. A few weeks after bringing a whole cohort of first-year students to campus, it closed and declared bankruptcy in the wave of co-ed education. Halcyon Hall, a 200-room facility that served as a hotel before being converted to an academic building in 1907, is still intact today. The abandoned property deteriorated and changed hands several times before surviving several attempts to demolish it. The halls, imposing and overgrown with plants, appear satisfied with suffering without totally collapsing. Number 3. Los Feliz Mansion, Los Angeles According to legend, Dr. Harold Perelson, his wife, and their three children lived in this hilltop estate. Perelson, a distinguished doctor in the late 1950s, became horrified about the state of the city and, to some extent, the world in general when he savagely murdered his wife in her sleep with a ball pin hammer. He took his own life by swallowing acid and taking tranquilizer tablets after attempting the same horrible crime on his young daughter. Many people have speculated without success his reasons for executing such heinous crime. The haunting of the mansion that followed has been persistent, although many owners bought and sold it several times over the next 60 years. What's creepier, the house changed little until 2016, with the same dust-coated decor and eerie emptiness as it was in 1959. Would you be brave enough to spend the night in such a place? Let us know in the comments section down below. Number 2. Lennox Castle, England John Lennox Kincaid, a descendant of the Earl of Lennox, had this home and castle located north of Glasgow built in the early 1840s. The Glasgow Corporation bought and converted the castle into a mental hospital. The main castle structure was surrounded by buildings that eventually housed approximately 1,200 patients. Fights, instability, and riots among the patients began to break out around the turn of the century. In one such brawl in 1956, some of the male prisoners attacked the nursing staff and guards later captured and confirmed them to a tiny hut. Scottish authorities had the Lennox Castle Hospital decommissioned in 2002 and they demolished all other structures on the grounds. The Celtic Football Club attempted to create training facilities in their place. The castle has since succumbed to fire and nature, and it now stands as a stunning, haunted ruin. Number 1. John List House, New Jersey John List murdered his whole immediate family in their New Jersey home in November 1971, including his wife, mother, and two children. He then saw his 15-year-old son play soccer before shooting and killing him when he returned home. Then, in the ballroom, which had a signature Tiffany stained glass skylight valued at at least $100,000, he lined up all the bodies except his mother's, turned on all the lights, cut his face out of a family portrait, and escaped. Authorities did not discover the bodies in crime scene for another month when classmates, neighbors, and teachers wondered where the family had gone. Meanwhile, List had moved to Denver, where he worked as a manufacturing controller and ran a carpool service at his Lutheran church under a fictitious name. In 1985, he met and married a woman there, and it wasn't until 1989 that police apprehended and arrested him. He never accepted responsibility for his crime. Thanks for watching. Which one of these abandoned mansions would you like to visit? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks again and we'll see you next time for another amazing video right here on American Eye.